Good afternoon, everyone. I am so thrilled to be on a stage looking at a sea of faces in this very warm, wilting day. You're all here to support this particular book, which, of course, is a far departure from the conversation we've heard so far, but I hope will be equally interesting to all of you. Uh, my name is Shoba. I also have the distinction of being uh, this big man's younger sister, and I am... I am absolutely thrilled to have this new and unique opportunity to be on stage with him. I write books primarily for children, but um, have been a big fan of his work, his thinking, his ideas. And Joseph Zacharias is someone I actually spent uh, almost a month getting to know during my brother's first campaign. And he's absolutely wise, witty, and delightful. So I'm hoping that all of you will enjoy the few questions I have to um, approach them with. So I'm going to start with my big brother. His, uh, as you all know him as a politician, as a, as a thinker, as a public intellectual and all of that. This book is, um, you know, even if you see some of it as veiled uh, advice or politics, it is very much uh, an accessible, interesting book that sort of is um, almost a companion volume to his book called Tarurasaurus, which was a collection of well-known words from all, uh, from the entire alphabet, large words, unused words, inscrutable words in some ways. So Shashi is known very often as uh, the wizard of words. So this is a little bit about that as well. I'm going to start with you, Shash, and then I'll go to Joseph. My question to you is, um, your last book was about Ambedkar. It's a historical book. You're a historian, you're a, your PhD is in law and diplomacy and history. Um, why a book on aphorisms? Okay, now first of all, I, I have to, I'm really sorry to start off contradicting you, my dear sister. Uh -oh. It's not a companion value volume to Tharurasaurus. That is a book called Shashi Tharur's Wonderland of Words, which is coming out in 2024. Uh, and that is at the moment with the publishers for consideration. But this one actually started in an amusing way. My publisher, David Davidar, actually suggested uh, that I should write a book of aphorisms. And I kept dilly-dallying. You know what aphorisms are, right? They're short, pithy, often witty insights into life and living, uh, which are supposed to encapsulate some sort of wisdom as well. And uh, I dithered and didn't do anything about it, and I kind of uh, let it pass for many a year. And then suddenly, out of the blue, my friend Joseph Zacharias, sitting here, completely unexpectedly wrote to me, saying that he had written a book of aphorisms, and could I give him my opinion? So I was delighted, and I thought, two birds with one stone. I can help my friend, and I can also get rid of my obligation to David. So I wrote to David and said, look... I have not done a book of aphorisms for you, but here is someone whom I really know and like who has done one. Have a look. So I sent, David, uh, sent Joseph's manuscript over to David. And David came back after a few days saying he liked about half of the manuscript, wasn't so happy with the other half, and he threw me a challenge. He said, you didn't have the time to write a whole book of aphorisms. Why don't you write half? And then we can combine these two and we can have a book. So I said, look, I think Joseph has every right to withdraw his manuscript and go to another publisher. So I wrote to Joseph and said, this is what David is suggesting. What do you think? And Joseph said, I'm on with you. Please do it. I take full liberty. Choose what you want. And so thanks to Joseph here, I ended up uh, looking through those of his insights and aphorisms that David had liked and um, having to scratch my brain and come up with some of my own. And the thing is that the reason David had asked me to do it in the first place is he found that a lot of my writings and speeches did include aphoristic uh, lines, sentences that he felt could stand by their own, apart from the context in which they were written. And that's what's true of Joseph's. He has come up with ideas where you don't really need any context at all. The sentences by themselves encapsulate a thought that you should perhaps want to reflect upon. So that's what we did. Okay. Uh, it's a combination of his work and my work, not, um, not written in collaboration. That is not that Joseph wrote something, sent it to me, I sent something back and back and forth. He had done his half, I did my half, we put them both together, and here we are with the book. I will say there are some, uh, oh, I've forgotten say. what percentage, about 10 or so, which are jointly attributed to both of us, where 
though David wasn't totally content with a particular formulation, either by Joseph or by me, when I read it with the same idea but with different ways of expressing it, it passed muster and got published. So that was my second question, and that's to Joseph. Joseph, if I understand it, this is uh, your first book. It's also a co-written book. What was it like doing a book with Esty, who you've known when he was in politics in, in 2009? You had worked with him. You had known him at that time as well. This is You're working on a book with him. And as he just said, some of the aphorisms are co-written. How does one co-write an aphorism? I'll tell, I'll tell you how. <laughs> That's how we wrote this book. And thanks for all the opportunity, sir. I'd just like to say a few words about him because he's my senior and my most affectionate one of the most affectionate and truthful persons I've seen in my life. The first thing is, I would like to point out about one particular aphorism in this book, that is serial number 203, in which we wrote, Socrates spoke, Plato wrote, Aristotle acted. That's Dr. Sashitharu. He can speak, he can write, and he can act. He's a good orator, he's a great writer, and he's a very intelligent politician. Then once I asked Dr. Therur, why, why shouldn't you write your autobiography, it's high time. Then he tells me, no, I will do it later. But I found out the real secret about that. An autobiography is written by a person who's got a bad conscience. Isn't it, sir? Now this aphorism. Now aphorism is basically a theme. Any book can be distilled into an aphorism. And it should be, otherwise that's not a good book. Whenever you read, finish reading a book, that book should be able to be defined in one line, one theme. And that's the aphorism, okay? And then, I, I just conclude with another one. In one, uh, it's uh, aphorism number 72. We have written that fools search for the truth and the wise let the truth find them. Now, this applies to writing as well. I just found out. The inferior writer he goes in search of words. The good writer uses the words that he has. And the great writer allows the words to come and use him. So that's how a good writing comes out. Good for you. I like that. <laughs> and finally, every workshop has got some unused tools lying around. So I thank dear sir and the organizers for making use of me and not and not being an unused tool in this workshop. Thank you. So that's not how it an was unused to work tool with him. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, so for example, uh, Joseph would come up with insights and sometimes I would end up polishing them as it were uh, or modifying them. But some of the book, some of the ideas in the book are totally Joseph and, and I would probably not have written them. For example, he has this piece of advice for employees. He says, never drink with the boss and don't carry his bags either. <laughs> now, I think that's... In the United Nations, you probably did differently. No, I, not only did I drink with my boss, I can proudly point to a boss, Kofi Annan, who cooked for me and my family once on one weekend. Yeah, yeah. That was a different kind of working relationship from the one that Joseph feels is ideal. But for me, I had, I'll give it to you. And, and then about carrying the bags, you know, it's, it's in, in our country, particularly, people do it as a courtesy. I mean, I'm very often carrying a bag myself and somebody will come and insist on taking it because they want to feel that they're showing you respect by doing that. So ultimately, what meaning you read into a gesture is what's at issue here. But I'll give it back to Joseph to contradict me. To contradict? Okay. I have never had a drink with him. <laughs> ah, yeah. So I don't, live up to, I don't live up to the promise. We'll take care of that, <laughs> Joseph, one day. So, Shash, I have a question for you. What do you think is, is sort of explaining um, this huge resurgence of interest in words, in literature, in language? I'm seeing that a lot. I've been writing books of that in, in you know, using words as, as, the, as the theme of the book. 
writing poetry, instructing on, mm. on poetic uh, forms. Uh, and I'm noticing now that you've written a book on aphorisms. You've also done Tharu Resource, which is on vocabulary. And you said there's a companion piece coming up. So what, what do you think? Is it, is it what you said in the last hour where you said, rather than filling minds, we need to form minds? Um, anyway, I'll let you answer that question. No, I, mean, I, I think that the interest is growing in India and in all sorts of things. You know, publishing industry has expanded dramatically. Uh, when first books came out uh, in the English language in India, they were all of the so-called Indo-Anglian literature, you know, trying to capture profound insights into the Indian experience in, in the English language and find the broader readership for them and so on. But then inevitably, I remember giving an interview, God knows about 20 years ago, saying that, you know, uh, I will feel that Indian writing in English has really come of age when there are also detective novels and rom-coms and chick lit and all of this kind of stuff and teenage romances and all that also available in English because people who speak English in India, whatever small percentage they may be of the overall country, they should be able to have access to all of this kind of thing just as in any other thriving uh, literary environment in other countries, all these forms also flourish. And I'm pleased to say that everything I said in that 20, 25 year ago interview has turned out to be true. Now there are Indians writing detective novels in English, they're writing crime thrillers, they're writing historical fiction, they're writing rom-coms and chick lit and all that sort of stuff. It's all happening. And so I think publishers are also much more receptive to new kinds of books. Uh, Tharurosaurus, for example, was a book that came out of a publisher's idea. Uh, and, and I played along with it because without really seeking this, I got this reputation for being a bit of a uh, 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 I don't know, word, maven, or whatever. And so I said, all right, I'll do it. And it turned out, in fact, to, uh, to have a continued appeal to, exactly. to some people, particularly younger people anxious to improve their vocabulary. But I might say to all of you, the best way to improve your, your vocabulary is just to read and not to mug up words, even from my book. But anyway, so that sort of thing is happening. And the book of aphorisms was, in some sense, part of that. In every other literary culture, somebody has come up with a book of aphorisms, and Indian English there hadn't been any, and Joseph and I are therefore pioneers of a particular form that, uh, that perhaps deserved an earlier airing. That makes sense, yeah. I mean, uh, my latest book of short stories is talking about idioms, and I addressed some uh, school children yesterday, and many of them, because I didn't know how to say the word idiom in Malayalam. How do we say idiom in Malayalam? Idiom? Chollugal is uh, uh, idioms and proverbs. In Hindi, it would be muhavre, but I was explaining to them that it's essentially phrases that are part of our language that are not to be taken literally, but are figurative language. You know, it's a figurative language. So it means something more in your cultural context, and the more you use it, the more you understand it. So you're right. There is the, a, a huge... Um, a sort of a seeking of minds for that kind of thinking and writing as well. You can't hear me? Sorry. That's much better. If you speak into the mic like this, it'll travel farther. Sorry. You're getting a bit soft. Okay. So, Joseph, I have a question for you. There was a particular idiom that I think was attributed to you. This particular book of idioms, it's very interesting. At the back, the publisher has divided up the idioms written by Shashi Tharoor, the idioms written by Joseph, and then there's a selection of, I mean, not idioms, sorry, aphorisms, and then there's a section of aphorisms that were co-written, and that was the first question I asked you, how did you co-write it? Uh, not entirely sure that I got the right, got the proper answer back from you, but there was a particularly good one that was very interesting that was attributed to you, and it says, when the fool points to the moon, the wise man does, does not look at the finger. I thought it sounded really brilliant. And then I thought about it for a while and I wondered, was that your usual mischief or is that a word of wisdom no. to us? There is always something called the first book by any author. So if any new author finds it really tough to get published and everybody thinks that he is a fool. But the good publisher will not look at the finger or who's pointing the thing. He will look at the book. That's what I meant. Ah. So, the, so the wise man will never look at who is pointing the thing. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, there, is, there is a whole section, I mean, well, not a section, but there are some very interesting Ghanaian proverbs 
uh, or aphorisms that are listed in this book, uh, Shashri, and I guessed, though in one instance, I think you say it came from conversations no, no, wherever with Kofi I've, Annan. Yeah, I've said it through well, Kofi I would love to, I'm sure everybody would like to know the story behind those, and I, let me just read them out to you. One second. So, for instance, um, there's, a, there's an aphorism that says, never hit a man on the head if you have your fingers between his teeth. And there's another brilliant one that says, if the sharks bite you, do not bleed. What's the story behind both of these? So both of the, Kofi and I worked very closely together, seeing each other several times a day. And Kofi Annan, who was Under Secretary General for Peacekeeping initially, and then Secretary General of the UN, um, he was very fond of, of uh, speaking in <laughs> this kind of uh, aphorism, uh, which he claimed had come from his father, uh, a Ghanaian tribal chief. Uh, of, the, of the older times. And um, it was when um, uh, we had a particular challenge with a rather powerful uh, permanent member of the Security Council, and I will not go further in saying which country it was. And I said, why don't you uh, confront them on this? Why don't you say publicly that this is wrong? And then he said, as my father would say, never hit a man on the head when you've got your fingers between his teeth. In other words, when you hit somebody on the head and your fingers are between his teeth, your right. fingers get bitten off. So by taking on a very powerful a member state, the Secretary General might lose his own fingers, that is his own ability to work with that member state on other issues in future. The, where the sharks bite you thing is very interesting because uh, he came under a lot of very unfair and savage attack at one time. And, uh, and he, you could see the pain and torment he was going through, but he's a man of immense dignity who never showed uh, publicly of what he was going through. Uh, and um, he said his father had taught him this Ghanaian proverb, when the sharks bite you, do not bleed. And I said, but Kofi, how is that possible? When sharks bite you, of course you'll bleed. That's where the sharks are biting you. <laughs> he said, Shashi, one day, believe me, you'll understand the meaning of what I've told you. And I didn't initially. And then I came into Indian politics and I became the victim of unfair and, uh, and, and, and unjust and cruel attacks. And I realized that, of course, I have to be as dignified and, 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 shall we say, calm and focused on my own work as it was humanly possible to be. However much pain I may have been going through privately, I could not give the sharks the satisfaction of seeing me bleed. And that was, to me, a, a very, very valuable insight. Uh, the English talk about phrases like grace under pressure. It can be sometimes as simple as not bleeding when the sharks bite you. And I think it was wonderful. Joseph, this, uh, this book has been very interestingly divided into sections in which these aphorisms are grouped. So there's a section called the mysteries of life. There's one called of God and the devil, which makes it very interesting. There's eternal verities, there's friends and foes. So which section did you have the most fun contributing to? No, it was not like that. We had a number of aphorisms, and David, it was David, the editor of the publisher of LF, who did this entire section wise, this thing. So after the next stage, we were not involved. He rearranged the whole thing into various sections. Ah. They, he didn't ask us to write within sections. I he, see. He, he converted our, bunched them together into sections which worked very well. Uh, yeah, and what I did was I moved some aphorisms from a section that David had put them into another section where I felt they were more appropriate. But by and large, it's exactly as Joseph said. David did something uh, as, as the editor and publisher, which is very useful. He gave the book its shape. He basically put the, the stamp of the structure, the chapters. He, it was his decision, for example, to number each aphorism so people could refer to them more easily. My insistence that there should be an index so people could find an aphorism more easily, according to topic. So it, 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 it's a collaborative effort. All good books should be. Absolutely. Joseph, um, I know that even when I met you about 15 years ago, uh, you always came up with these sort of pithy sayings and witty remarks, and we always sort of called you the wise man behind the desk. You, you usually didn't stand up for the pictures or come to the front front of the rooms. We had to go searching for you if we wanted to ask you. But most of the time I noticed that when decisions were being made, uh, even if it was short uh, administrative decisions, 
we would come and say, Joseph, what do you think? So as, as far as the fact that Shashi said you had sent him a, a collection of aphorisms that you wanted published, how did you put together this collection of aphorisms? Is it something you've been writing every day? Do you keep a diary? What do you do? This is thanks to my wife's coffee beans. Coffee beans? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So she, she's here. And she has a large number of plants. Her father had a coffee, cocoa plantation. And we had the habit of drinking the so-called filter coffee. Even in Delhi, when we were in Delhi. Oh. We, I used to buy it from the Indian coffee house. And every day, early morning, I used to have my cup and something, some fuse used to blow in my head. I used to immediately note it down. So this is a collection of our many years. Now I'll come to one of them. See, most 90, 100% of the aphorisms are based on our own experience. I'll give you just one or two examples. When I was 12 years old, I went to my friend's house to collect him to go, go to play. Then I found him cutting his grandfather's toenails. I mean, it struck me because the, the old uh, uh, gentleman couldn't bend down and do it. But this grandson was cutting his nails for it, my friend. Then 40, 45 years later, in 2013, my father was lying in the ICU, in the hospital. Then I noticed that his toenails had grown, you know. So it had a deep impact on me. That the elderly, now I, I thought I did that for my father, just for my father. I spent my time, money, or uh, every effort, my feelings. But I never noticed his toenail, See? which I should have done. And the poor uh, person, he never asked me to cut his toenail. I think if everyone sitting in this hall can go back home and cut the toenails of their elders, that will be a great thing, far better than any other medical thing you can do for a person. That's great. Then there's another one, which that, that I learned from my, it's called iron clothes inside out, first. And then you do the other way. This I learned from my Dobi in Delhi. He used to first do it the other way and then used to, most Dobis don't do that. They save time by just ironing it from the top. If we do that same thing for our self-improvement, first we clean up ourselves and then you do the change suggested by a self-help book or something, it will make a big difference. And lastly, the last thing I have to say is, we have written one called, if you have to be kicked, get kicked by an elephant, not by an ass. <laughs> Now, what happened was, I, had a, I was in government service and I was in parliament. So, we had every opportunity to go and work with all kinds of ministers because we had a certain specialization and every minister had to have parliamentary work. So, so uh, I, I used to get offers from cabinet ministers, not only me, many people in my office. And I, I was a fresher sort of guy and I had a little problem with Hindi because when I first went to parliament, all my colleagues were Punjabis. And Punjabi Hindi is very dangerous. So <laughs> I was scared to work with ministers. But then my friend, I have a very close Jat friend from Hisar. He was my colleague. So he told me, Are Joseph, Lata to khana hai, fir to hati se te ka, gade se nahi. Meaning, you, anyway, you got to get kicked. I, I might get kicked by some petty officer in my ministry or some secretary, IAS officer or something. Then why not get kicked by a big person? You got to get the kick, right? So what I'm trying to say is that everything what we have written, we can stand by it. I can stand by what he has written. He, he will definitely stand by what I wrote. That is why that is the real collaborative effort of this book, sir. It has nothing to do with sitting together and racking our brains, you know. Because in another place we have written, the secret of success is to get your mind to tell your brain to shut up and mind its own business. See, our, There's an aphorism and a our brain interferes and our mind keeps away. So you, you must get your mind to tell your brain to shut up and mind its own business, half your problems are over. Your brain will tell you to have a cigarette, drink some alcohol, do some crime. Your mind won't tell that. Okay, uh, you can also take, take down some of these notes, I guess, when you go home. Everybody keep a diary, it might lead to a book, just as it did for him. That's right, good exactly. idea. Exactly. Okay, I'm not sure that we would have enjoyed being kicked by an elephant, but I take the point. <laughs> I do too. Um, I know, Shashi, that you haven't really had a chance to write much fiction in recent years. I know that you have many, many books on the side of your bed that you want to read, and some of them are fiction. Um, my question to you is, 
to you, what matters when you think about books, and I don't mean specifically this book on aphorisms, is it the quality of the narrative that you first think about? Because someday you're going to write another book of fiction. Or is it the value of the structure and the words that you use? So in other it's words, both in some way, Shobha. Thank okay. you for that question, because actually, um, I wrote only three volumes of fiction and one of short stories, so three novels and a collection of short stories. But I've always thought of myself, um, my beginnings as a writer were in, in the world of fiction. And every time I publish a book, at least somebody would write to me, some stranger would send me a message or an email or a fan thing or whatever saying, when can we expect another work of fiction from you? And it's, it's kind of nags away the back of my mind. I mean, I, I do believe that fiction reaches uh, parts, as it were. Yeah, I don't know if many of you remember this old beer commercial that talked about uh, a beer that reaches parts that other beers don't reach. And I often say that fiction reaches parts of the reader that nonfiction cannot reach. Nonfiction essentially appeals to the mind. Fiction appeals to the heart and appeals to the gut and appeals to the soul. That's where you, can, you want the reaction from the reader. And that's why I think I would love to go back to that. But with fiction, I'm, I've often argued that the very word novel means new. And therefore, there must be something new about any novel you write. Otherwise, what's the point? And since no story on earth is ever totally new, what might be new is the way you tell the story. Exactly. And so each of the three novels that I publish is written in a very different style. And it's because I've tried consciously to do something different in each case, not only with the tale, but with the telling of the tale. So if you read the great Indian novel, it is the Mahabharat reinvented as a satirical novel, telling the story of the 20th century freedom struggle yeah. from roughly the turn of the century to about the time the book was written, which is 1987, 88, and doing so in a satirical style that was meant to be reminiscent of an epic. So all of this was there. And I further threw into it the, the um, uh, resort to verse, light verse, limericks, doggerel, and so on, because the Mahabharata is actually a work of poetry. It is not prose. It's the world's longest poem. And therefore, many translators, defeated in rendering such a vast work into verse, have done it in prose, but have explain that in introduction that there was poetry and so on, or some like the famous Professor Pilal actually broke into verse occasionally in order to re reflect the poetic quality of the original. So I borrowed that idea as well, and I started breaking into verse every time I wanted to change a mood or a transition uh, from one kind of uh, narrative to a more satirical one or whatever, and that, that's... So all of that way in which the story unfolded became essential to the telling of the story. Uh, similarly, my second novel, Show Business, was about the movie industry at a particular period in Bollywood. And therefore, it's, it's constructed in a series of, of uh, takes. And each take consists of three shots. And each shot has, uh, the first one is the superstar hero of the book lying in a coma in a hospital bed. The second one tells the formulaic story of the movie he's acting in at that particular phase of his life. Uh, coupled with mad, bad lyrics. And then the third one is a narrative about his life being addressed to him by one of the important characters in his life. So you've got each of these uh, sort of segments of three unfolding the story of this, of, this, uh, of this character. And then with my novel Riot, what I did was I actually had 13 voices, 13 completely different voices, uh, writing or speaking different kinds of English. Was it also news clips or news? Uh, there, was, there were some news clips. There were news of one. There was an American journalist reporting from India, and there were news clips from him. There was also um, uh, a Hindu nationalist, because this is set in the riots of the Ram Sheila Pujan movement that preceded the demolition of the Babri Mas Babri Masjid. So you had a, a Hindu chauvinist sort of talking his kind of thing. You had a, a Muslim historian. Uh, speaking of history like a scholar, but at the same time, his own passions. Then you have a young IS officer, overeducated, smart, writes poetry on the side, struggling with his job. 
You have an earthy Punjabi policeman. You have this young, impressionable American uh, do-gooder who's come to India. And all of these characters have their distinctive voices, their distinctive concerns and the ways of telling the story. And so you hear the story of the riot in 13 different voices at different times. And in theory, the book is constructed in such a way that if you want, you can pick it up and read any chapter first and go back. As long as you read the whole book, you get everything it wants to say. You don't have to read it in order. So it's all these experiments are meant to serve a purpose. And the purpose is that the telling of the tale is as important to the reader as the tale itself. And as the words that you use to tell the tale. And the words that I use to tell the tale. So both are equally important to you. That's very interesting. Joseph, is there a favorite section in this book that you want to read out to anyone? Is there a favorite aphorism from the book, perhaps? You already told us one, I think. There are quite many. So one of them is, if the devil comes uninvited, continue with your work and tell him to either wait or go to hell. <laughs> because often when we get tempted, we stop our work and then, so the delaying, the but that part is very good. Another one is, never, there are no lines between friends. Drop any friend who draws a line, because there cannot be lines between friends. Often we have friends and then, so there's no line between friends. There are hundreds of them. So you can read it, you can finish this book in 30 minutes, and then you can take 30 to 300 hours to go to back and read and it. enjoy that book. Please do, there are, there are many. Then there's one called, which, now that this is interesting, there's one called, there are two types of restaurants. One with fat managers and thin waiters. <laughs> and the other with thin waiters and fat managers. Choose wisely between the two. I love it. <laughs> so many people ask me, what is your decision? I said, I don't know. I, that's the reason I never go to restaurants. <laughs> The wife's cooking is superb, or yours is. Uh, Shashi, there's a section on family and other relationships, which is really quite interesting. It's a list of truisms in many ways. There's a, a particular aphorism that says, your glitter attracts the spouse you want. Its absence attracts the spouse you need. Is this an example of learned wisdom for the next generation? I hope so, but I'm not going to say oh, it's my learned wisdom, but I see a lot of people around who, uh, uh, I, let's be very blunt, your glitter, meaning your prosperity, your wealth, your flashy car, your flashy clothes, your ability to spend a lot of money will uh, perhaps attract the kind of lady who gets to be known as a trophy wife eventually, somebody who's herself beautiful, glamorous, etc., but who's attracted by all those attributes of yours that are really superficial. Whereas if you had none of these things, you might attract a person who actually sees you as the human being you are, with your vulnerabilities, your ordinariness, your, your decency. So I've seen this in so many examples uh, around my life that I thought it's worth sharing. Uh, a lot of people uh, who have this kind of glitter tend to look for spouses who they think will complement their glitter because they have a different kind of glitter themselves, usually to do with looks and bearing and so on. Uh, whereas the real substance of a relationship uh, is well beyond uh, what that glitter implies on either side. Um, I've all, there's another one I have about how the most important thing in a relationship is actually temperament. Uh, and I think that's, that's really true. Again, I've seen this over and over again. Um, you might have perfect intellectual companionship, but one person might be somebody who uh, loses her temper all the time. Or you might have personal sort of wonderful sexual chemistry, but you don't have, uh, uh, shall we say, the, the temperamental nature that will enable you to, to get along with each other all the time. And therefore, the sparks may fly inside the bedroom. But they also may fly in your daily life and make you miserable. Uh, you may have... Um, financial compatibility or status or rank or position, but you just may not have the kind of nature that gets along with the other person. So all of these things, I think, can be boiled down to the aphorism, I, I'm not sure I have it immediately to hand, that, um, that um, there it is, yeah. 
Uh, anyway. Um, Pick up the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you know, I still have to go and look at the index and find it in, on the page. Um, and there's a wonderful one by Joseph I'm going to get him to read to you. Joseph, come on. So Joseph has a lovely one saying, you are taught by your father, but you learn from your mother. Think about that. <laughs> well, I was told that we are going to release the Malayalam edition of this book and that I was supposed to stop at this time for that. And then we get the audience And then stopped. we'll definitely open it up to questions. I hope you've enjoyed this. It's definitely a, a very different conversation than the one we had with Anita Pratap, with her brilliant, incisive questions and my brother's equally brilliant responses, I thought. Thank you. Now it's time to launch the book, Ittiri Matram Ubadesham, Ottiri Adhikam Vityanam. The Malayalam translation of the book, The Less You Preach, The More You Learn, Aphorisms of Our Age. I request Shobha Taru to launch the book and Joseph Zakarias to kindly oh, receive it. Please give them a huge round of applause. Ittiri Matram Ubadesham, Ottiri Adhikam Vityanam. Bustaka Pragashana Manevde Narakanada, Ithiri Matram Ubadesham, Othiri Adigam Vitnanam, I'd like to open this up to questions to both of them. Lots of hands in front. There must so be somebody pass a mic on. I think if you attract the attention of that lady, she'll give you the mic. <laughs> right, it was great looking up to you literally from down there. Uh, Thank in, you. Uh, many of your speeches you've mentioned uh, as to how different you give out uh, speeches in different places you go to. So, for instance, uh, when we, you're in a foreign country, you start with a joke or an aphorism or sorts. And you've mentioned that uh, it's well received in that part of the world. But when it comes to, you know, an audience like Kerala or in India, you often end up getting a cold response. So why do you think that's the case? And what does that say uh, as, as a, a society? It's a very, very good question to which I don't have a great answer. Because I have, uh, you know, when I was... Uh, when I was making speeches in the Western world, and I was doing them fairly successfully, before I came into Indian politics, I used to get $50,000 a speech in America. And uh, it certainly was a very comfortable life. I always made it a point to begin with a joke and to throw in one or two more to break the ice as the conversation went on, and then to get into the serious matters. In Kerala, I tried that, and there was a completely stunned silence. Nobody laughed, nobody even smiled. And I, 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 I'm truly wondering what the reason is, because after a while, I just stopped cracking jokes in Kerala. End of story, you know, I, and, and not just in Kerala. It's also true with many, many Indian audiences elsewhere. Um, are we a humorless people? No, we crack jokes at home all the time. We are sort of, uh, all the poor Punjabis get, and all the Sardars get teased with one joke after another and so on. So I don't think that we are a humorless country, but somehow I think we don't expect humor in public places and we don't expect them from people we're supposed to respect. So, um, and you know what happened to me when I tried to crack a joke early in my political career and I got slapped down rather, rather severely by the public. Um, uh, I, can, I can share the story with you if you want, but there's so many other hands going up. Uh, I, think, I think many of you will know what I'm talking about, the sort of infamous cattle class controversy. And the irony is that, is that you know, I genuinely thought I was just being funny and it became a political scandal. Uh, so I stopped trying to be funny because humor, A, doesn't work, and B, works very badly in a multilingual country where everything gets translated into 10 different languages and the humor is very quickly lost. One last insight I gained from that was actually one that Shakespeare had taught us many centuries ago. Shakespeare wrote, the success of a jest lies not in the tongue of the teller, but in the ear of the hearer. And that, I think, is a wonderful insight. Whatever your intentions may be, everything depends on what they think they heard. And if they think they heard something insulting or malicious or whatever, or unfunny, then it doesn't matter that you had the best will in the world and you delivered your joke perfectly, you shouldn't have said it. I've learned very fast never to do that again. 
Good evening, sir. Yeah. I am NCK Abdullah, businessman at Caligate. Right. My question is about one of your book. I re recently had your book, Why I Am an Hindu. So I went to the Madhuri book stall a couple of years back. Then I bought, bought one copy. I, I uh, read it completely. It took months. I'm because sorry. A, a lot of pages, more, hundreds of pages are there. Because I couldn't follow most of your words in English. Because I am a Malayalam medium student at that time. Yeah? I'm sorry. So I am a 70 year old young man. Yeah? So uh, You don't look at I, my <laughs> My question is that, why you, what is your inspiration behind that title? Why I am an Hindu? That is my question. So I wrote that book, so it's a brilliant book. Then I uh, told my friends in, in my occasion, in my function, you, you, you should uh, buy and uh, read the book. Uh, not my question is, what is the inspiration behind that book? Um, mainly that title, why I am an Hindu. Okay. Well, you, are a, you are a secular person, I know, purely. Okay? Right. And by the way, the book is also available in Malayalam, which might be a quicker read. Who knows? DC Books has brought it out. But just, just to say that, uh, uh, I had actually talked about my personal beliefs in three pages of India from Midnight to the Millennium back in 1997. I was published late 96. And that's all I thought it needed. I never really, uh, I, 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 I saw my religion as a very personal matter between me and, and my vision of my creator. I didn't see any need to talk about it much more. But once our political environment began debating the meaning of Hinduism. And we had a ruling party and its followers exhorting people constantly to take pride in being Hindu and in advertising their Hinduness. I began to wonder, what is this that I have been very proud of being a Hindu, but my idea of what I should be proud in, proud of, and, and what I should take pride in is so different from theirs. So should I not interrogate in more detail what my Hinduism means to me? Why I describe myself as a Hindu? So I, I, I spoke aloud about this to my publisher who is a Christian himself. And he said, by all means, right, he's a Christian married to a Sikh. So I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a complicated situation uh, for him. But he said, you must write it. And I sat down and I, you know, obviously, I had acquired my Hinduism through the English language. I have read extensively many of our sacred texts in translation. And I have imbibed a lot of my vision of Hinduism from Swami Vivekananda. Most of his speeches were in English. So I was not even feeling the disadvantage of understanding him through translation because he was actually delivering those ideas in English. And therefore, to me, I did not feel handicapped that I didn't know Sanskrit myself. I knew a few mantrams but I didn't know the language, just pick up a text of Sanskrit and understand it. But I could do it through translation. And then I decided to complement my knowledge and my reading through actually delving into some, some uh, original texts. And there are very good compilations available of good translations of everything, the Vedas, the Bhagavata Purana. Uh, a lot of our texts are available. The Gita, of course, multiple translations of the Gita. Yeah. So I went back in to verify my understanding of many of these things. And then I wrote, and my idea was that the moral urgency of describing my kind of Hinduism was because I felt there were many Hindus in this country who had grown up with the kind of Hinduism that I had grown up with, but who had not consciously formulated their own idea of their Hinduism, and that therefore I was addressing people who were in danger of being misled by a different sort of reductive version of Hinduism that was sought to be spread by the Hindutva movement. And that's why I decided to boldly say in the title itself, why I'm a Hindu. I was not saying why I'm a secularist or why I'm a secular Hindu. I was saying I'm a Hindu and this is what I was brought up to do. I was brought up to respect other faiths. I was brought, brought up to respect the core idea that the truth is one, but the sages call it by different words. Ekam sat vipra badanti. That I was brought up to believe in Sarvadharva Samhava. I was brought up uh, on Swami Vivekananda's Shiva Mahimna Stotram, which says that just as many rivers flow, some straight, some winding, 
and end up in the same sea, so also all modes of worship end up with the same creator. These were very core fundamental Hindu ideas that were being betrayed by a different set of people calling themselves Hindu who were actually reducing the soaring majesty of Hindus, Hinduism's philosophical inquiries, its respect for incertitude, and reducing it to something more like the football hooliganism uh, of the British uh, football fanatic, who will go around saying, if you don't support my team, I'll hit you on the head with my placard. That kind of Hinduism is not Hinduism to me. Okay. So that's what I was uh, uh, talking about. And I'm very gratified at the feedback I got from a lot of people who don't agree with me politically, but agree with what I have, because everything that I've said, I have referred to original texts and, and episodes from the, and of course, others will say that you've picked and chosen what you want. You can also pick and choose other things. True. I don't, for example, believe that I am obliged to follow the dictates of the Manu Smriti when it comes towards women. I grew up in a household full of strong women, two sisters and a mother who work no nonsense. So for me, the Manu Smriti's attitude to women was irrelevant to me. It was not something bad. Similarly, I did not believe I had to honor the caste system. My father had given up his caste name in college, and he never mentioned anybody's caste who came to the house. I never knew what my caste was until a, a film actor asked me when I was 11 years old what my caste was, and I couldn't tell him. He said, you mean you're not a Brahmin or something? And I couldn't even tell him if I was a something. I had to go home and ask my father. And he said, you know, this is something I have to explain to you, but I didn't think it was necessary right now. Now that kind of, that nationalist generation never mentioned religion, never mentioned caste. They were interested in India, they were interested in Kerala and the unity of Kerala and the unity of India. They were not interested in what divided us. So I just want to say that to my mind, the book needed to be written because there was a vision of what Hinduism is that wasn't being told. That was the answer. Next question. Um, afternoon, sir. So, so there's something called as the writer's block. Um, unfortunately, what most of us from our generation are facing is a reader's block. So you said that you've kept some books by the side of your bed that you yeah, have the sundoku read. pile as it's called yeah yeah which is which may be because of paucity of time that is not a reason for a lot of us so how do you think uh, we people the ones who because we see there's a decline in reading in general how do you think we can overcome the this, this, is, this is a real challenge and it starts at home because i meet too many young kids i don't know whether you have a kid or you're old enough to have one but there are too many young kids who think of books only as something relevant to their schoolwork and their homework and the moment the homework is done or the schoolwork or the exam is studied for, they put away books and they turn to a screen, a TV screen, a PlayStation screen, a mobile phone screen, whatever. To my mind, that is a terrible loss because ultimately you are essentially becoming a cipher in somebody else's imagination. When you watch a movie on TV, you are not, your, your brain is not engaged in imagining anything. The act, the character is as the actor portrays him. The scene is as the producer has chosen to depict. The costumes are what they've done. When you read a novel, on the other hand, each of these things has to be processed in your mind. You are inventing how the character looks like to you, what he sounds like to you, what that woman's dress looks like, what the scene that is being described by the author or not described by the author might be. It's a much more active engagement. So the brain works much more through reading. And if the children don't want that, they're losing out. And then... The entire notion that books are only for the class means that they're missing out the pleasures of, of reading. And the fact that a book can be a source of entertainment and pleasure, that is in danger of being lost to the young. So I, I share your concern. The one good thing is we're publishing more books than ever in India. So clearly somebody is reading them. The publishers won't be throwing money into books unless somebody was reading them. Uh, but the fact is that even if reading is a minority pursuit, it needs to be a large enough minority for the health of our society. And therefore, start at home, make your children acquire the habit of reading, and it'll sustain them. It'll sustain them when their batteries run out. It'll sustain them when <coughs> they're on a beach and they can't plug in their tablet or, their, or their, their mobile. It'll sustain them on a plane. It'll sustain them whatever they do. And above all, it will challenge them in ways that passive entertainment cannot possibly. And if I may add to that, 
read the kind of books you want to read. You don't have to read only the bestseller or only a book that's critically acclaimed. Read the books that interest you. Once you get in the habit of reading, it's going to have its, be its own joy, truly. Uh, Even if it's a you know, graphic novel or a, or, a, or a comic book, you can tell the children they can start with that. Any questions for Joseph? Uh, good afternoon, sir. I have a question regarding our democracy. You talked about... A little right? higher. Yeah. You talked about democracy. Uh, since we are a parliamentary democracy, don't you think that we are converting like some parliamentary democracy, we are converted into a presidential democracy and the values of federalism are being lost, like in the sense that uh, in Madhya Pradesh, we had chief minister who was, uh, who was getting selected, but we have uh, one-time MLAs being selected by the chief of uh, one party. So how do you see uh, the transition has been happening? And do you think that we'll get back to the original four that our constitution makers or the forefathers has envisioned? You know, actually there was a good debate uh, in the constituent assembly about what kind of system uh, to take. Ambedkar himself would have preferred a presidential system. So would I, very frankly. Right now, we have the worst of both worlds. We have a parliamentary system being run presidentially. In other words, that we have essentially one man rule, but with a guaranteed parliamentary majority, which would never happen in a presidential system. In a presidential system, the legislature is selected independent of the executive and the legislature does not form the executive and the executive cannot dictate to the legislature. They're independent bodies. I'm a sort of believer in the classic separation of powers. You need an independent legislative to hold the executive accountable. You need an independent judiciary to hold both these accountable. Today, we have a system where the legislature is essentially a rubber stamp for the executive. And the judiciary is getting intimidated by that uh, legislative majority in some of its own decisions making. So I think in many ways, we have the worst of all worlds for our democracy. I would much prefer a system in which there was genuine separation of powers, but we don't have it. Now, of course, Ambedkar also warned he said the best constitution can be terrible if it's, if it's implemented by people of bad faith and the worst constitution can be wonderful if people of good faith run it uh, in, a, in a liberal democratic minded way. I don't think we have people of particularly good faith operating our constitutional system right now in that they have very often, while sticking seemingly to the letter of the constitution, violated its spirit, infringed upon our democratic rights and freedoms, trampled upon the human rights of many individuals in our society, prosecuted people uh, uh, for, for minor offenses that involved their right to dissent. And all of these things have been happening while the institutions that were supposed to protect our system are being hollowed out. Uh, you know, RTI is essentially no longer RTI. Commissioners are completely under the control of the government instead of being independent as originally envisaged and so on and so forth. I mean, all the independent autonomous institutions have become much less free and independent than before. Uh, so what can I say? People have to stand up and reclaim their rights. It's your country. You have the right to demand uh, a change. Uh, Neleville, <laughs> The problem is never with the faith, but with the faithful. Joseph.
There's a lovely aphorism about it in the book. Uh, Sorry. This is related to a question about sir's qualities Faith as a speaker. Uh, there's something about speech. We can think that speech is one single thing. It's not like that. There are many aspects of speech. This is the aphorism which relates to that. And sir asked me to read it out for you. Learn exactly when to get into a debate, start a discussion, deliver a speech, make a sales pitch, and set an example. Once you do this, you will succeed in life. Good job. There's another one. Faith is sometimes a shield, often a crutch. Behave, beware of faith when it becomes an ornament. Well, everyone, I'm afraid we've run out of time. I want to thank Joseph so much and Shashi as well, my big brother. Thank you all of you for coming. This is a book of written with a lot of a lot of soul searching, a lot of reflection. This is a collection of deep thought on many levels, and yet it's very light and entertaining as well. So I hope you'll enjoy the book and you've enjoyed the conversation. Thank you all for coming. There's a Malayalam edition as well, just launched this afternoon. And, and is there a signing afterwards? There will be a book signing in the book signing area immediately afterward. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much, speakers. That was such an amazing session.